Multi Hazards, all about protecting communities. <laughs> Why are conspiracy theories so popular these days? Is it social media? Or are we just more gullible nowadays? Join Dr. Gaida Hassan, a clinical psychologist and professor at l'Université du Québec à Montréal, UCAM, as she discusses how conspiracy theories are affecting society and how we can overcome their influence. Have a listen. Hello, dear listeners. This episode is where I have a great conversation with conspiracy theories expert, Dr. Gaida Hassan. But first, let's give a territorial acknowledgement. We work, study, and live in a region south of the Stalo, a.k.a. Fraser River, which overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Semiamu, Sawasin, Kikite, and Kwikwetlam peoples. These are the names of the First Nations groups who have inhabited this land since time immemorial. This land near me, also known as Greater Vancouver, here on the west coast of Canada. So my guest for today is Dr. Gaida Hassan. She is a clinical psychologist and professor of clinical psychology at UCAM, which is the, let me get it right here now, L'Université du Québec à Montréal. She has a number of research, clinical, and community-based national and international affiliations. She is the director of the Canadian Practitioners Network for the Prevention of Radicalization and Extremist Violence. So it's called CPN-PREV, funded by Public Safety Canada. She is also a UNESCO co-chair on prevention of violence, radicalization, as well as a researcher and clinical consultant at the Sherpa Raps team and the CIUSSS-Codium. She is a researcher, clinician, as well as a policy consultant in matters of interventions in the context of violence, for example, radicalization, family violence, and war. And now, without further ado, let's get to the interview. Hi, everybody. This is the Multi-Hazards Podcast. And today we feature Dr. Gaida Hassan, conspiracy theories expert. So it's great to have you on the show, Gaida. How are you today? Thank you. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Okay. So today's topic, conspiracy theories. This is very, very important. But uh, first of all, Gaida, I'm just wondering, how have you and the people around you been coping during this uh, global pandemic? Well, I think we've been coping okay, <laughs> just like. Uh, Just like everybody else, this has been a very, very challenging time um, uh, that really called for a lot of adaptation and uh, and some some tough events as well related to COVID in in my personal and family life. So it's been quite some tough time. Right, right. Yes, every place. And you're on the other side of Canada in the province of Quebec, and I'm on the west side of Canada in the province of British Columbia. So I know some similarities and some differences uh, between the whole response to, to COVID, but it's all, always been stressful for everybody, I think. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I found about you from this, uh, it was actually Reader's Digest, a kind of reprint on MSN online, and it was called The Real Reasons People Fall for Conspiracy Theories. So that really piqued my attention, and it was an interview with uh, Courtney Shea, I believe, and it was a really good short and sweet summary of the problems, I thought. So I'm just wondering, uh, how did that article come about with you? Um, well, actually, it's, 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 a pretty, it's a pretty neat, it's a pretty good summary indeed. And, uh, you know, I've been working for a while now on, on extremism issues and, and, uh, and conspiracy theories more, more recently due to the kind of connection with some of the extremist groups that have took advantage of the crisis around COVID and kind of further fed this conspirational thinking. So it's been quite a while, you know, that that we've been working um, on on the topic. And 
it became a very hot topic and a hot issue, <laughs> of right. course, with COVID crisis. Yeah, exactly. COVID has brought a lot of different things out into the world that um, maybe they were kind of hiding, but it, uh, COVID was kind of like uh, opening a Pandora's box in some way. So now I'm just wondering, in a nutshell, Gaida, what would you define conspiracy theory to be? Okay, so in a nutshell, conspiracy theory is really a system of, of thought, of belief, uh, that constructs a perception of an event uh, that evolves uh, principally or in a major ways around the fact that a group of powerful people are uh, conspiring, are putting their efforts in order to purposefully harm or abuse another group of people. So, um, I mean, there are many definitions of conspiracy theories out there, but it very simply represents the fact that somebody out there is organizing maliciously a plan to hurt another group of people. Right. Okay. So, and these days, what are some of the most recent examples? So I guess uh, some of the very recent examples uh, around conspiracy theory have uh, in these days been a lot expressed by a group called QAnon um, around uh, the, the pizza gate issue, uh, around the group of powerful, you know, U.S. politicians abusing children and, and, you know, doing all sorts of horrific things to children. Around COVID also, more specifically, there has been some conspirational thinking around uh, COVID itself, the virus itself, the vaccine, uh, what the vaccine is supposed to, you know, why is it fabricated and how it's supposed to control and harm a given group of people. So these are, you know, the quite a few modern or very, very recent conspiracy theories that have been uh, quite popular lately. Right. So, and it's not just the pandemic. Um, how how these days are people getting sucked into these theories? So, I mean, uh, there are several reasons. Usually, uh, when a crisis happens in our life, you know, sometimes when we suddenly feel that we are losing control over certain aspects in our life, we are in a situation of crisis we tend to feel a lot of anxiety and angst and tend to seek answers. We try to seek answers to understand what is happening to us. And I have to say that unfortunately, uh, internet has played a big, big role because today, most of us will likely try to seek answers on the internet, in the different media outlets, and not often by simply discussing with our, you know, parent, partner, neighbor, friend, whatever. And so um, we have a tendency <laughs> when something, when a big crisis happens in our life to seek some extraordinary answers. You know, we just can't accept sometimes that extraordinary things happen for simple reasons. And we tend to try to construct those very complex <laughs> Uh, answers and um, conspirational uh, theories and conspirational ideas are very attractive because they tend to soothe our anxiety. They tend to provide us clear cut, all or none answers. Uh, they tend to situate uh, people or events as good and bad. So they kind of uh, provide very simple, very total answers. And this is very attractive to our human brain <laughs> because, you know, it, 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 it makes us move away from complexity and ambivalence and ambiguity that usually produces, you know, feelings of uncertainty and anxiety. We tend to look for simple, clear-cut answers where there is somebody to blame. And this is exactly what conspiracy theory theories do. So this is why they become very attractive. And then with the role of the internet and social media, there is this kind of algorithmic functioning and echo chamber where the more you read something, the more you receive notifications to read more and go deeper and deeper and deeper into that topic. 
which then, you know, works on convincing you more and more that this is the right way of thinking and that you actually share this with so many other people who are like-minded people. And it makes you even more entrenched than in, in that belief. Right. Well, two things I could say about that. One is that I'm old enough to remember before the internet that it took a long time for these conspiracy theories to travel, right? It, it wasn't like now they can travel within hours or days. But back then, you know, we have the major cable TV networks. We have newsletters, uh, newspapers, mail, but things traveled slower. And uh, the internet is kind of like super speeded everything up, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and the second thing is that I know that now, even in schools, they're teaching people to have, I guess we'd call it internet literacy or these skills to be a, a, a to kind of have the healthy skepticism. The problem is, is that conspiracy theorists, they think that is healthy skepticism. So what is the difference between like actual evidence-based healthy skepticism and then conspiracy theories. Yeah, so um, this falls down to the difference of what we call healthy skepticism and hyper-skepticism. Hyper-skepticism, which characterizes more conspirational thinking. So healthy skepticism is our ability to doubt and to be critical about information that we receive. And usually when we have healthy skepticism, what we try to do is that we try to verify the information that we are reading or receiving. We often verify the source. We try, is this the source a credible source? Is it a credible media? Is it somebody I know and I trust? And you know, is that person credible? And then we tend to verify facts. So is the information that I'm receiving based on some sort of documented observable fact. And so skepticism is good. We need to critically, you know, not just believe everything that is told to us and be able to analyze and look at the pros and cons. And when we have healthy skepticism, we are, we do accept to be contradicted. So we do accept to say, oh, you know, I had um, I was very critical, but in the end, when I verified the sources, the facts, you know, this makes sense to me. Hyperskepticism is really about uh, believing that others have nefarious intentions. So actually that somebody out there means to harm me as a person or my group. And we usually do not verify sources or facts. We actually look for information that confirms what we already believe and tend to neglect information that contradicts what we already believe. And so it is this uh, tendency to over doubt in everything by, by attributing malicious intentions and neglecting contradictory facts or other contradictory opinions. So constantly moving in confirming basically our ideas. It's completely different <laughs> from healthy skepticism. It's actually the resistance to changing our own minds. That's what hyper skepticism is about. It has like a, a kind of a bit of a paranoid <laughs> twist to it in a way. Right, uh, another word is confirmation bias, isn't it? In a way, in a way, but I mean, it is confirmation bias a bit pushed to the extreme because we all tend to have confirmation bias. It's a natural cognitive bias we have, but in hyper-skepticism, it's, it's also more than that, okay? Uh, we may have confirmation bias without believing that others have malicious intentions. Uh, in the hyper-skepticism, we really have this very entrenched belief that somebody is out there trying to hurt me or my group. Right, right. Now, in the United States of America, they have had a lot of conspiracy theories. And I know it, we are in Canada right now, and we tend to like blame the U.S. for everything and say, look what they're doing. They're so extreme. 
when in actual fact, we have a lot of the same problems. It's just that we seem to be blind to them. So I'm just wondering, what about Canada now? Do we have any like home-brewed conspiracy theories or maybe something we've imported? Uh, well, we do have home-brewed conspiracy theories. We do import. I think it's very important to say that um, some, of, some of the actually leaders of extremist groups uh, that are very active in the U.S. are Canadian <laughs> originally. That's right. And so it's very important to, to, to not to tend to have this romantic picture of our country that, you know, we just negatively influenced by the U.S. That is not true. Um, it's not completely false, however, because uh, given the size of the U.S., given the political polarity of the U.S., I mean, just to mention that um, Trump came after Obama. So, you know, those deep contradictions in the way that the uh, U.S. functions sometimes does, of course, kind of influence us in some ways. So that is something we should not neglect. Um, but we do have uh, QAnon in Canada. Uh, we do have extremist groups in Canada. Right-wing violent extremist groups are on the rise in the country. Uh, hate crimes are on the rise, hate incidents as well. So it's very important not to neglect uh, this issue. And I think, as I was saying earlier, one of the things that uh, worried us in the field was that extremist groups and mostly right-wing uh, violent extremist groups have took advantage of conspir conspirational thinking to attract people to join their movement, to kind of mobilize people to action, which we did not necessarily previously see, you know, previously kind of conspirational thinking was functioning in a parallel way from extremist groups. But extremist groups, given that they have already big tendencies to think in a conspirational way, saw in you know, the rise of QAnon, for example, a great occasion to recruit even more and more people in their, in their uh, movements. Right, and maybe they didn't even believe it. <laughs> they're just, mm -hmm. they're just kind of using it, wow. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, now, so you're saying some of them are political, and uh, these conspiracy, and some aren't. And uh, for example, I got into a conspiracy theory around, say, nine years ago, saying that Wi-Fi's and Wi-Fi data towers and these transmission towers, they cause cancer. And there was like a couple, one doctor out of Ontario and then maybe in the United States. I remember a speaker, he came to our town here and he, he basically was saying it's genocide. You know, they want to kill us all with the the Wi-Fi and the data and the signals that are coming out. And I was really into that for maybe about six months. And then it kind of faded after, but that wasn't really political, but maybe if it kept going for a few years more, it could have gotten political. So. Absolutely. I mean, it gets political when uh, either you start believing that there are politicians and political classes involved, or when you feel that now you need to take on political action uh, to change this. I just want to highlight again that it is normal for people sometimes to believe in alternative facts, you know? And so um, a lot of people who may believe in conspiracies, um, it, it is just transient sometimes in their lives and they will never become entrenched or will never become violent. Or it's very important uh, to, you know, to, to say that sometimes in our lives, we all in a way deep inside may believe that sometimes, you know, um, some social leaders or political leaders may on purpose uh, do or plan harmful things. It is okay. It's it's very important not to demonize people who have conspirational thinking at some point in time because it's part of that skepticism. But as you say, at some point in time, maybe you checked facts, uh, maybe you thought more about it, maybe you were in a better emotional, relational life state, um, and you started drawing away more from this, uh, from this belief or from this idea. Um, right. Now, a lot of people use the phrase these days, it's called 
I've done my research. <laughs> and I saw a PhD on Twitter and she was like, you've done your research, huh? Well, have you checked out all of the peer reviewed articles? Have you done, you know, a literature review? Have you done this? Have you done that? And she is saying, don't tell everybody you've done your research in kind of an academic way when all you've done is gone onto Facebook and kind yeah. of just uh, checked out some posts of things that already agreed with you. So. Yeah. And the, but that this is this is the main problem with the with the information available out there on internet with I mean anybody could put out anything out there on the internet and and what internet and social media does is that it kind of removes the uh, a certain hierarchy in information where in the sense what I'm trying to say is that on the internet, Anybody could be saying things that will be considered as truthful as a scientific study. So a scientific study is not does not appear to be more valid than uh, I don't know somebody, some leader, uh, some influencer, you know, stating an opinion about a certain thing. And so it gives us this impression that we, when we've looked up a few information on the internet, that we've actually done research. And so coming back to your point about critical media literacy or critical internet literacy, this is exactly what we try to teach uh, people. And I do not think it should be only in schools. I think adults <laughs> need even more critical media literacy than children. It actually teaches us what does it mean to read an information on a web page or social media. How can I verify this information? And what does this information, how does it influence my cognitions, my behaviors, my attitudes? So critical media literacy is not just about understanding how to smartly <laughs> approach information on the internet, but is also to understand the impact of what we read on how we think and how we feel and how we behave. And this is crucial uh, because this is one way to go forward in preventing vulnerability to all sorts of uh, harmful information that is out there on the internet. Right, so do you think people could um, just look at Google Scholar or ResearchGate or something that if they have access to some good articles on the topic they're trying to follow? I mean, there are, I think there are a lot of uh, websites that are meant to inform and educate people and that kind of, they, they can go on those reliable sites, they can go on, on, on academic sites if they want, but there, there are also certain websites that kind of summarize, synthesize, let's say the state of scientific evidence on a topic or um, that kind of critically debunks, for example, certain beliefs or certain myths. It's, it's very important. Um, again, verifying the, the credibility of a source is important. When we are entrenched in a conspiracy theory, that's a different issue because those sources that the general population would believe as reliable uh, are not considered as such, right? Because all these are part of the conspiracy. <laughs> so, so we need to approach people who are entrenched in a conspiracy theory in a different way from the general prevention. Right, okay. So it's not necessarily less educated people. It could be any of us it's just that it's kind of hard these days to find out what is actually the truth to things absolutely and it's not connected to i mean in if you look at global populations you may find uh things such as level of education or uh, financial instability, for example, as, as variables that, that do play a role. But when you look at, at individual cases, at least in Canada, uh, of those people who were kind of um, heavily entrenched, 
where it was starting to affect their mental health and their family relationships and their careers. And then you do not find a clear association with, with level of education, meaning very educated professional people may fall in conspiracy theories. And then it really becomes more a matter of life crisis, uh, you know, there, then there are the other variables that explain. And most of these variables relate to a crisis that happens in a person's life where they become distressed basically and more fragile. Right, I've seen actually recently reports that it seems like somebody's loved one or their friend, it's almost like they're trapped in a cult and the person was reaching out online saying, what can I do? So have you seen those kind of uh, situations, yeah, yeah. Kaida? Yeah, we've seen and we have people reach out to the teams uh, across the country. Um, there are uh, web-based resources to support uh, uh, you know, family members or, or who, who care for somebody who's being entrenched. Um, there are certain websites that, that give information uh, to the to the you know to the to the people who would like to understand okay how do I approach uh, my friend or my colleague or my partner should I confront or not um, you know what should I do in what ways can I help so there are certain uh, brochures but there are also hotlines in the country and teams uh, in the country that people can get in touch with uh, to seek help and assistance. Uh, we have those teams on the CPN Prev webpage on the map. People can identify a team in their province, for example, and simply get into our city and get in touch with them if they are really very worried and, and they feel that you know, help is needed uh, in, in the short term. Right. Okay. That's great information. Now, Kaida, I saw online on CTV, I think it was from last January 2021. Now, that was a very sensitive time because there was the storming of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. The U.S. was switching presidents. And there you stated, you said, it's a long process. A lot of things have to be put in place at the same time. We have to understand that we have that we have to do prevention. We have to implement several, several measures that can prevent the spread in the general public. So I think you were answering questions there as to like, you know, why is it that everybody is, you know, getting up in arms and getting sucked into these conspiracy theories? And you were saying that, well, it's not just like you can come in at the last minute and save people, as you were saying, it's, it's better to go for prevention. So I'm just wondering if you have some more things to say about that. Um, well, I have to agree with myself again. <laughs> yeah, agree with yourself. <laughs> no, I mean, um, you know, just like in any phenomenon, unfortunately, we tend to uh, wake up uh, a, bit, a bit late in the process. Um, you know, governments and societies are responsible in uh, setting coordinated uh, prevention initiatives at several levels. I still do believe, I, I know we need more research evidence, I, that I agree, but I still believe that educating, uh, you know, that establishing in schools, integrating in, in the education programs, educating around diversity, around, uh, you know, critical media literacy, or at least under critical thinking, just simply critical thinking. And, you know, how, did, how do I, how can I become a healthy, uh, you know, healthy skepticism? These are important issues and they need to start very early, uh, even in primary school. I think we need to put programs with adults, uh, with people who are on the working workplace, work market, you know, on these issues around healthy skepticism around the role of internet in my life, the influence that this information has on me. Uh, what we observe on a macro level is that in times of social and economic or political crisis, people will tend to go more to the extreme in terms of behaviors. So conspirational thinking become more uh, you know, attractive, uh, violent behaviors become more attractive, 
losing trust in the government institutions become easier. And so governments and societal institutions have to consistently work on making sure that they are trustworthy. Population, that the population trusts them because hyper-skepticism comes when we feel, for example, and conspirational thinking comes when we feel that those political leaders, those powerful people in our society are untrustworthy and they do intend to harm us, which come to think about it is highly problematic if you are a citizen and you think that your political leaders are out there to hurt you, we have a big problem. <laughs> They're supposed to be there. <laughs> We've elected them to make our lives better. And so the trust issue there is very important. And so whenever a country or a society goes through a crisis, governments have to do all what's possible in order to preserve economic stability, for example, social stability. They have to send clear, honest messages to the population. Uh, so that this trust issue is preserved. And then, of course, at a tertiary level, meaning when people become entrenched, then we need more uh, specific or specialized intervention programs or interventions. So, you know, uh, we really have to, we don't, we, we don't try to, you know, uh, how to say, um, um, shut the fires or stop the fires. We have to make sure that fires do not start in the first place. Right, exactly. Now, but a problem in all this is that there are actual conspiracies happening. Yeah. For example, between um, certain very powerful corporate, uh, uh, well, let's see, industries, for example, and they are lobbying the government to make sure that their initiative it could be, say, fossil fuels. It could be like um, internet companies. It could be like um, big pharma. It could be other things. And they are actually, and they've been caught and they've been charged in court because there has been behind the scenes shenanigans going on. So actual conspiracies. So I think that nowadays we have a, a kind of a, there's a blurring between this skepticism and conspiracy theory because sometimes we actually have seen things going behind the scenes. So I'm just exactly. wondering what you say. Exactly. And this is why I said we, we should not have this demonizing approach to conspirational thinking because from the beginning of history, conspiracies have existed. And so sometimes it is good to be skeptical <laughs> and even to wonder if there is a conspiracy there. But then you need to verify you need to check facts. Uh, you need to go search for information that is reliable to, you know, to tell you whether, okay, you know, things are pointing indeed toward a sort of conspiracy or this all looks harmful, uh, but actually there's no real conspiracy, meaning there is no clear intention from a social or political class to clearly uh, conspire to hurt. But maybe a social or political class are taking decisions that are hurtful in the end, but based on their own misinformation, based on specific interests, but not based on a clear intention to hurt people. So I'll, I'll give an example that may not be maybe the best example, but when cigarettes were first produced and sold, and you know, massively, uh, we know now that smoking may contribute or in increase the risk of a person having cancer. Now, I do not think that the first person who created whatever a cigarette company knew that and had the intention of saying, I would like to cause cancer in the most people I can. Right? So right. it was a decision. It was something that was harmful to the population. But only evidence and research made us discover that. But in the origin, so I think 
there is there is the issue there is that not necessarily all decisions that are taken by economic groups or political groups or social groups that become harmful were intended in the first place to be so. Right. So the 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 word there, the key word is intention. And of course, we have a legal system where they will say, OK, was this a, was this a, a planned action or did it just kind of result that way but it wasn't actually planned and I can think for example one of my examples would be the opioids crisis I did some research on it and then I found out that it seems there was collusion between government officials a lot of government officials and big pharmaceutical companies but um you know, we can't say that somebody 30 years ago sat down at a table with a few friends and said, we're going to actually, this is how the next 30 years is going to unfold. You know, it, it could be planned. And, and mm-hmm. it's, it's just a lot of, how do we say it? There, there's a lot of things involved over many, many years. And if we're studying this, we need to be patient because all the truth, it takes a long time to figure things out, right? Exactly. Whereas those conspiracies that really happened, we were end up able to prove that there was a planning component and that there was an intention and that people were aware of what they were doing and they knew that the consequences will be harmful. But that was intended. Is it because it produced a lot of money, a lot of profit in the end, or, you know, regardless of what was the end benefit for that, uh, those people who were involved in the conspiracy, uh, we know that the intention and the planning were initial components or you know, central aspects of these conspiracies that do actually exist. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Now, coming back to social media giants, uh, it seems as though we need a whole new legal framework to kind of control these social media giants because it seems our laws are based on decades ago and we need to really update things because Twitter, Facebook, all these big social media, they have such an influence these days, which used to be just like, as I was saying before, from newspapers or for cable news or other media, but now they kind of control the whole thing. So I'm just wondering what you think might, uh, or should happen to the social media giants? Yeah, this is a very complex uh, issue. Now, I know that there are uh, efforts. So the, the GIFCT, the Global Internet Counterterrorism Forum, uh, has been put in place a couple of years ago. And they are, uh, people can go on their website and check uh, what their activities are because, you know, they have promised transparency. So they do uh, you know, summarize their activities and, and put things uh, out there on the internet. And this forum actually allies the, the tech giants, so Twitter, Facebook, Google, uh, and, the, and the others. Um, and they do try to make efforts. Now, those efforts are uh, directed toward terrorism, more specifically, um, not conspirational thinking, not even, uh, you know, other forms of, of violence. But Um, Why am I mentioning that? Because there is an effort that is starting. I still do believe, however, that this effort is not enough. Uh, I think not only do we need national efforts, um, is it around laws? Could be. Um, But if it's not laws, because, you know, it's very complicated to change laws and it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of evidence, but it's definitely around certain policies. It is also around regulations that have to be, uh, let's say, implemented within those big tech companies around how they manage that content and what is allowed in terms of content and how it's managed and how it is prevented and how other uh, help options are available for people who come across, for example, that content and need to, to step out of it, but just don't know how. Uh, a lot of the ways that, you know, a lot of the algorithmic functioning of, of internet is problematic, is leading to problematic consequences, and this needs to be reviewed. The only thing is that these, this needs to be an international effort, not just a national effort, because the problem is that 
when an effort is done on a national level, a lot of the uh, people, let's say, or groups who are feeding those conspirational theories or those extremist theories will then only migrate to other platforms in uh, other countries that are not controlled. Uh, or let's say, you know, where, where, um, the, where the governmental or the social structures do not exist to kind of, and even the companies, the small tech companies themselves, do not have the financial and human resource capacity to kind of regulate the content or regulate how their technology is being used. So that's, that's a big question. And if it's big, it does not mean that we should not tackle it. We've, you know, internationally, United Nations and what others, uh, other huge structures have tackled issues more complex than that. So things have to be done. And unfortunately, the more time goes by, the more I think that tech companies have to be, governments have to regulate because I am from those who believe, you know, that's my personal belief for whatever it's worth, that because of the economic profit being the top priority of tech companies, they will be very resistant uh, to deep changes in the way that they regulate their content. And unless they feel a certain pressure to regulate, uh, they will not do giant steps in terms of, of progress and regulation. Right. And I thought even as a Canadian, we, we have all the social media, but it seems to be American. And a lot of us are like, well, whatever, because when you go out of your door of your, your home, everything or half the things out there are American owned anyway. But, you know, during the capital storming, I thought, you know, what if one day we had a hostile neighbor to the south and their their government changed to authoritarian and then what would Canada do we're still controlled by Twitter Facebook and all these social media so it seems that that these media they have a what do you call it an outsized influence and it's not just in the U.S. it's just it's worldwide so it, yeah. it's it's very powerful yeah, but the fact that they have an outsized influence does not mean that countries cannot regulate yeah. how uh, they function within their, uh, let's say, virtual borders in a way, <laughs> although there is no such thing. But um, so, and again, uh, this points to the fact that, you know, it has to be an international effort. It, it just cannot be based in one country or in the hands of only, you know, two or three uh, media giants. It really has to be a, a global um, effort. Uh, but of course, it has to start with the most powerful tech companies. That's, that's definite. And those companies seem to have intentions to regulate. But as I say, um, I don't think that, I think they have the capacity to do much more than what they're currently doing. Exactly. Yeah, maybe they're making a lot of money off conspiracy theories. <laughs> so. I mean. Yeah. Maybe somebody can do their PhD thesis on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, how much money are they getting out of this? So I was looking at your background, Kaida, and I found it was very interesting. You're a clinical psychologist. You're a professor of clinical psychology. And it seems that you've been dealing a lot with um, children and youth, and you're also the director of the, how do we say it, Canadian Practitioners Network for the Prevention of Radicalization and Extremist Violence. So I was just wondering, how does all of this background relate to your interest in conspiracy theories? Uh, well, actually, um, it, it, well, why psychology? Because we discover that people, at least in Canada, who act violently on the basis of extremist ideas or conspirational ideas um, have important uh, psychosocial uh, suffering. And so 
mental health professionals, uh, psychosocial services professionals have a lot uh, to contribute to the, you know, to the to to, to assisting individuals and in, 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 uh, at risk, let's say, or victims for that for that matter. Um, why conspiracy theory in connection to extremism? Because um, many of the extremist groups, uh, when you look at their um, way of, you know, when you look at their ideas, the ideas that they tend to 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 uh, uh, to promote, you will find a deep conspirational thinking underlying. Um, the ideologies, let's say, of, of extremist uh, groups. It is it is deeply conspirational in terms of in terms of thinking, and this is where the in interest in conspiracy uh, in conspiracy theory came. And then it kind of uh, you know trickled down very fast with the COVID <laughs> with the COVID crisis. Um, and so these these issues have more in common that what may appear to, to individuals who may be less familiar with these concepts. Okay. Now, did this um, CPN Prev, did it uh, kind of feature Islamic radicalism in the beginning, I'm wondering? Uh, actually, it was one of the organizations that pointed to the uh, double standards in this field. Because in the beginning, when uh, the term radicalization and you know violent radicalization and 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 the prevention of that came along it over focused on quote unquote uh, islamist uh, or islam inspired groups such as daesh for example um and it really uh, justified a lot of unjustified uh, oppression and and repression and surveillance of Muslim communities, and it became highly stigmatizing to Muslim communities and ostracizing and kind of, you know, placing a lot of Muslim uh, youth, particularly in a pre-criminal space and profiling them as if they were, you know, just being Muslim became uh, a source of, you know, uh, doubt in, 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 a, in a citizen's uh, honesty or, you know, capacity to be a good citizen for Canada. And so CPN Prev very, very quickly highlighted that this was a dangerous slippery slope to society and that it was completely wrong way of understanding violent radicalization because uh, it completely neglected extreme right-wing violent groups that were rampant in Canada uh, since the you know, 19th century, Ku Klux Klan and what the like, you know, it's not something new to the history of, of Canada to have extreme right-wing white supremacist groups. Um, and this is not to deny that Daesh <laughs> exists and has done horrific things, but it's just to say that violent radicalization is an all spectrum of religions and all spectrums of, of ideology. Uh, we have violent religious, Catholic religious extremist groups. So it's not about um, a specific religion. And so CPN Prev now looks at and examines all forms of violent radicalization, including uh, religiously inspired, but also other forms of ideologies, such as, you know, political or, uh, you know, or racial ideologies like white supremacy, uh, xenophobic uh, ideologies, highly misogynist, uh, ideologies such as, for example, the incels. Um, and so really we kind of uh, have tried to, to kind of debunk a few myths <laughs> around the phenomenon and attract the public attention to, to, uh, to the different forms of extremism uh, that exist in the country. Right, That's, that is actually really wonderful. And the reason I say that is because in my point of view, it's kind of like white supremacy. And then maybe I'm not sure about incel, but uh, some of those things we can kind of call it insider. It's kind of the product of Canada being part of the British Empire and basically where white supremacy was the white man's burden, so to speak. It was part and parcel of the empire. And then Islam was kind of seen as one of these, among other things, too. 
but one of the other, so to speak, right? And yeah. it's kind of like, it's easy, easy to scapegoat one com religious community in Canada and then survey them when we're forgetting about our own deep history of white supremacy and what we have done in Canada against, for example, Black people or Indigenous people Absolutely. or um, people with uh, different religions other than the majority religion. So I really love what you're doing there. I think it's, it's very necessary. Thank you. Right. Now, I'm just wondering, what would you like to see happen as soon as possible, I think, in Canada, the U.S. and worldwide regarding conspiracy theories? <laughs> As soon as possible. Oh, yeah, nice to quand. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I guess uh, I would like cons real conspiracies to stop. <laughs> no, but I, I think that um, what I want is to stop demonizing people having skepticism, uh, understanding that, you know, conspiracy theories exist, but then mobilizing rapidly, uh, uh, you know, and at all levels, um, uh, prevention initiatives in order to uh, make people more resilient, let's say, to, to harmful conspirational thinking, making them healthy skeptics, people who have good critical thinking, which I think is absolutely essential to protect the society and to continue to be critical towards what our ruling classes or you know the powerful economic or social classes uh, do this is very important as citizens we have to be critical and uh, you know keep uh, let's say protect our society from any forms of, of abuses but in a healthy way in a way that is positive that is constructive in a constructive citizenship not in a harmful, destructive uh, citizenship, often based on, uh, you know, a, a personal crisis um, that really threatens more uh, the social balance um, and threatens more social stability. And so there are prevention initiatives and programs that exist. We just need to put more efforts into having those uh, having those uh, programs. Right, exactly. And we have a Canadian election happening in a month, and I hope nobody's going to use conspiracy theories to try <laughs> to win votes. <laughs> so That would be uh, a very bad sign of the quality of the leadership. <laughs> of the leadership. Yeah, exactly. Any of them uses that. Hopefully we're not, uh, we're not gone that far in terms of... Uh, of desperation to win votes. <laughs> exactly. So I'm wondering, what last message would you like to leave ringing in the ears of the audience, Gaida? Well, uh, I think the last message I would like to leave is for us to, each one of us to re-examine um, our role as uh, constructive citizens um, to society. And I think it's very important for each one of us to understand how we can constructively contribute to make our society a better place. And uh, maybe one, one last message is for each one of us to really step back and understand our behavior on the internet and take a step back from the influence of, of internet and social media in our lives. And take some time to revisit what critical thinking means. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That is very powerful. Well, thank you so much for participating, Kaida. And I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> okay, take care. All right. And that's it. Wow. A big shout out to my awesome guest, Dr. Gaida Hassan, for joining me here today at the Multi-Hazards Podcast. And an important disclaimer here. First, this podcast is meant to be educational and does not try to offer legal, medical, or other specific professional or expert advice unless otherwise noted. Second, the opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of the organizations that either my guests or I am working with. So, 
Here as I conclude this episode, thanks to all of you once again, my precious listeners, for joining the Multi-Hazards podcast today. Stay safe out there and stay tuned for more episodes. This is Vin Nelson wishing you the best on your journey of surviving and thriving with all that life throws at you. Cheers to you all. Peace out.